Um, so nice to meet you guys. I'm Dr. Steph, and I'm excited to be guest lecturing for you today at Dalhousie. I just wanted to thank Eric, Paul, and Sina for putting this lecture series together. Having presented at several other schools, it's just really inspiring to see all of these student-led initiatives, you know, really taking ownership of their financial education just from the ground up. So today I'm going to be giving you the introduction to Money and Medicine, an Intro to Financial Literacy. And it's the same type of presentation that I give to uh, my classes at U of T. So just as a disclaimer, I don't have any conflicts of interest to disclose, and I'm not being paid by anyone um, to give this lecture. Uh, these slides are just for education purposes, and all of the views um, presented today are not a substitute for financial advice specific to your personal situation. So what are we gonna talk about today? So I'm just gonna give you an introduction on why I'm so passionate about teaching financial literacy. Talk a bit about the financial myths um, that you might hear that people give you a, as advice um, in upper years or as a staff physician. Uh, some ways to reduce debt, an overview of investing and social determinants of wealth. The last part will be a question and answer. So during the presentation, if you have any questions, send them directly to the moderators and they'll save them to the end where it's not recorded so that it's kind of like a safe space for you to ask me candid things and I'll give you a candid response. So I just wanted to introduce myself briefly. So as some of you guys know, I give the personal finance lectures for the med students at U of T and I'm also on their financial aid committee. I blog about personal finance on Instagram at Breaking Bad Debt and I do addictions medicine as part of my day job. And so why am I so passionate about financial literacy? So for some of you guys who may have uh, heard about me from my article in JAMA, um, my parents and I came to Canada with three suitcases and $1,000. And so my parents did not attend university and I was the first in my family to go to university and become a doctor. So what my parents taught me was, you know, if you work hard and you're frugal, then you'll have enough money to live by. And that's kind of the approach that I had towards things when it came to, you know, having three jobs during undergrad and then having two jobs during med school and my part time. So it was a lot of work. I was working really, really hard so that I can pay off um, my tuition. So during medical school, I was fortunate enough to be accepted into a master's program that allowed me to also go to business school. And interacting with the students there, it was actually the first time I really got into investing and when I heard about it. And all this time I was like busting my ass working all these like jobs. And then these students are talking about investing and investing was a way for you to make money without actually directly working so much for it. And I was like, dang, how do I sign up? So when I was in residency, um, I started working on these fundraising campaigns for needs based scholarships to help low income students similar to myself afford medical school. And that was the first time I started meeting these like high net worth donors who could just drop $5 million right there for a donation. And during that experience, it kind of taught me, you know, if you give a man a fish and you feed him for a day, you teach a man a fish, you feed him for a lifetime. And so it made me realize that just raising a lot of these scholarships, raising money for these students, it wasn't enough because when they graduate, they're no longer getting any of these scholarships or these grants. They're relying on their own knowledge, their own financial knowledge to move ahead and sustain themselves in life, right? And so that's kind of what uh, led to the proposal for the financial literacy curriculum here um, back at my school at U of T. And so personal finance is personal. Um, and so the, the reason with personal finance being personal is that not a lot of people want to talk about it unless we decide to talk about it. And so during my presentation, I'm going to include a lot of audience polls just so that we can kind of enter this conversation about what are our personal finances, financial situations like. So just to kind of get to know you guys, because you know me already, um, the moderators will put up a poll on the front of the screen. And I just wanted to know what year is everyone in who's attending today? Okay, so it looks like a lot of you guys are in first year medical school um, and it's pretty much distributed across second to third year and then a few of you guys in residency. Really cool, okay. So let's move on to the second poll. How would you rate your financial knowledge? Stephanie, we're at 90 91%. I'm going to uh, share the results soon. Sounds good. 
Okay, so it actually looks pretty good. Like 22% of you guys don't necessarily know anything about personal finance, but a 35% of you guys are putting your money in a savings account. Um, some people have actually started investing already, which is really good. Um, and some people actually might have like a financial background themselves. So it's always really important to see what your classmates are doing because a lot of people think like, oh, my classmates, nobody's investing, so I'm not going to either. Um, but, or some people might think, oh, everyone is into investing and not me and I feel behind. When in fact, that might not actually be the case. Okay, so in this section of the lecture, I just wanted to give some financial myths because when I was a first year med student, I always got these types of advice from upper years or from staff physicians. And as I came to like progress throughout med school and residency, I started realizing that a lot of the times these uh, pieces of advice may not necessarily be true. So the first financial myth is people will tell you, oh, don't worry about medical school, you'll be set. When I was in first year and asking about salaries and about how to pay down debt, people were like, oh, don't worry about debt, uh, you'll, have, you'll make enough money. The other myth that I often hear is when you have other classmates on social media, you finish an exam and then someone um, purchases an expensive bag and posts, posts it on social media. And they might say, finished my exam, hashtag treat yourself. And so for a lot of my students that I initially started teaching, like those low income students, it really felt made them feel like inadequate or it made them feel like they couldn't keep up with others in their class who might be of higher socioeconomic status. And so the main message here is sometimes there's a lot of pressure by others on social media, especially on Instagram, where there's that pressure to want to compete or to be at the same level as someone doing what others are doing, when in fact you shouldn't be trying to keep up with your classmates when you cannot uh, in that case. And a lot of the third myths that I might hear is, oh, I'm too busy with school to manage my finances. I'm not the expert. And in medicine, we see that a lot. Like when we're not the expert in something, we'll refer to someone else, right? Or we're not specialized in something, we'll refer. But I always think that it's always a good, uh, it's really important to have a baseline knowledge yourself. So let me just talk a bit about debt. Um, how can we reduce debt? So I always tell all my students, in order to increase your net worth, you either can make more money or you spend less money. And it's hard to make more money as a medical student because you haven't reached that point where you can make something like a staff salary. But what is within your um, realm to do is to be able to spend less money. And this is pretty easy to do as a med student. This is where you have more locus of control when it comes to this. And so the purpose of this slide is when we look at medical student debt from the graduating class in 2020, the first takeaway from this slide is yes, there is a socioeconomic inequity in medical school students, um, in medical students across Canada. You definitely see that about 15%, 14, 15% of students will graduate medical school without any debt at all. And there will be another group of students who will graduate with a lot of debt. But for the majority of students, when it comes to the second important thing about the slide, is that a majority of students will graduate with about $100,000 in debt, which is still quite a lot of debt. And so the best way to you know, prevent yourself from reaching those high, high levels of debt is to be able to anticipate expenses by year. And this is a kind of an Ontario-centric slide. Um, your tuition may not be as much as this, this is more like U of T level tuition, but I encourage you to engage in an exercise kind of like this. And perhaps the moderators can help um, like with seeing, okay, how much is your tuition? How much are your living expenses? Fortunately, due to the pandemic, your living expenses in terms of rent and so on might not be as high if you're doing online learning. But the main thing I wanted to explain by this slide is, you know, when I was in second year, I knew that the AFMC elective booking system was gonna be expensive. I had heard that students will be paying a hundred bucks to book an elective without any guarantees of actually getting that elective. So they're just losing money by double booking electives and just so that they can get one. And so knowing that I tried to work a summer job to anticipate for that. Um, even in fourth year, I tried to, when I knew that CARMS was gonna be this expensive, um, I tried to either move back home or for students who can't move back home, um, they might move to a cheaper place or get, get a roommate or something. And so it's just important to know when those expensive years are going to be so that you don't end up overspending um, what you may have originally uh, budgeted for. 
So I'm just going to get the moderators to pull up the third poll. How well do you adhere to any form of budgeting, whether it be spreadsheet, planning for the upcoming month, etc.? Okay, so it looks like the majority of you, like 46% of you guys, you know, check your bank account to make sure that things on there are correct, which is really good, but you don't necessarily have like a budget or anything like that. And it's nice to see that there's still some people in your class that actually like set aside money and things like that. So that's just good to know. Okay. So how do I budget? And I just wanted to give you some tips. Um, personally, I know that there's a lot of apps out there, but I like to use like a traditional spreadsheet because I'm pretty old school and your accountant, when you do get one, will pretty much be old school as well. And my accountant requires um, an itemized expenses um, list uh, on a spreadsheet for tax returns. And so that's just what I, uh, I use. And when you're looking at creating your own spreadsheet, um, I personally use these categories as my expenses, but that's the, the thing to keep in mind is that some of these may not necessarily apply to you just because um, when you're a staff physician, uh, you have certain things like um, legal expenses or you might have um, business meals, in which case in your, in your situation, it would just be like a food expense, for example. Um, and so there are certain things that uh, you should put down in your as expenses or keep track of as expenses, because for instance, things like moving expenses, that has um, tax benefits for as well. And then on the other um, income category, uh, it's important to put things down like where you're getting your earned income, if you have a part-time job, scholarships, grants, things like that. And when you're budgeting, a good guideline is the 50-30-20 rule. Uh, and it was actually a guideline developed by Elizabeth Warren. Um, and what it is, is that um, approximately 50% of your monthly budget should be going towards things like housing, like rent and like the needs. About 20% should be going towards your financial future and about 30% can be going towards things like wants, concert tickets, takeout, things like that. Now, a lot of students will ask me, oh, but I don't have like a monthly salary. I just have this line of credit for like my four years in med school. So in that sort of situation, what you can consider doing is taking that line of credit, dividing it by the four years you're in med school, dividing it by the 12 months and um, per year. And that can kind of give you a guideline of how much money at the most you have to be able to spend. Now, I don't encourage you to spend all of that line of credit in med school, but you should know where there's a cap. Because if you don't know there's a cap to your spending and you think, oh, well, I have all this money in my line of credit, then your spending can go overboard. The other thing that I encourage um, uh, students to do is to just track their expenses, not necessarily budget yet, just track everything for maybe like a month or two, just to see where their highest areas of spending are and seeing, okay, what's making me overspend? What, cost, what costs me a lot of money every month and how I can maybe cut down on that a bit. And the other thing I like to think about when it comes to like, you know, what if I do want to treat myself? What if I do want to buy something, you know, that I like? So the way I approach that is I use something called a worth it equation. And there's two uh, types of worth it equations. The first type is if you took the cost of the item you want to buy and you divided by how many hours of work uh, you have to put in in order to pay for that item. That tells you the hours of your life that you gave up to trade for that item. So the other equation that I personally like to use is the cost of an item I'm looking to buy divided by how many hours I think I'm going to use it for, divided by like how many days and years I'm going to use it for. So just to clarify this a bit more, I'm just going to use an example. So I see a lot of my female colleagues uh, wear these type of shoes. I'm like, oh, a lot of people are wearing these shoes. I'm going to Google it and see how much they cost. So they cost about 1050 bucks um, Canadian without tax. And so a lot of times they wear them at like an event. So I'm assuming that they wear them for three hours because they look painful AF to wear. And so how much does it cost for someone to wear these shoes and to buy these shoes? They're using, they're, they're paying 350 bucks per hour to use these shoes. Is that worth it for me personally? I, I don't think so, but you know, it's just something to think about. Like, would you pay 350 bucks just to rent a sh these shoes for three hours? The other thing that I have that is kind of expensive is my laptop. So my laptop 
is like a really high end gaming laptop. So it cost about 2,300 bucks. Now that's a lot of money. And so the way I think about it is I actually am using my laptop seven hours a day. I use it every day a year. It's lasted me through all of CARMS, um, all of AFMC when you're literally trying to submit things on the hour um, and it's fast. So I've used it for so long that if you divide it out together, my hour of use for that laptop is 11 cents an hour. Is that worth it? I think that's worth it. And then the other thing I hear a lot of students will say is just, oh, you know what? I have a line of credit. I'll just pay it off as staff. If I have any expenses, I'll just put it on my line of credit. And so it's important to spend wisely because we have huge lines of credits. Like it's just getting more and more, 325 to 350 grand with uh, really low borrowing rates, in fact. And when you're a resident, your monthly salary is actually barely enough to cover like rent, licensing exams. You only get paid about like 5.5 grand a month, um, at least in Ontario. Perhaps in um, at where you're where you guys are from, it might not necessarily be that uh, that low. And so the main point of this slide is money is a good servant, but a bad master. So what this means is when you look at compound interest. Money is a good servant. It works for you and it can exponentially grow, um, but it can also exponentially grow your debt as well. So let's just say you decide to spend all 350 grand of your line of credit. And I can see some medical students doing that. Sometimes they buy condos and then they use their line of credit to like furnish. So use their line of credit to pay for all of the nice furniture in their condos too. So they have super bougie places and super expensive. Um, and a lot of these banks don't really require you to pay back your line of credit principal, but the interest will still keep accumulating. So let's just say you put that initial 350 grand spend into a compound interest calculator. This is how much money, 32 grand, is how much interest you'll be paying in addition to paying back that original 350 grand you borrowed. And if you have government loans for your tuition, you also have to pay that as well. And so when you're like graduating med school and starting off in residency with your first big paycheck, you don't want to be starting off in the wrong foot with a huge amount of debt. Thing. And I just want to give you a very brief overview of investing. So before I do that, I just wanted to ask the audience, what do you invest in? We're just at 92%. I'm going to sure. wait another five seconds. Sure. Okay, so the majority of you guys, it's kind of like all over the place. So the majority of you guys are at 61% um, do not invest. Some of your classmates invest in individual stocks. Some of you guys have mutual funds. Some of you are getting into ETFs and um, some of you are dipping into these speculative investments real as well as real estate. 1% does option trading. Okay, so that's really interesting to see. And this is actually very consistent across all of the other lectures that I've, I've given. Um, a lot of the students either don't currently invest or they might just do individual stocks or ETFs and mutual funds. So I see that a lot in my other lectures too. Okay, so moving on. So let's talk about the different types of investment accounts. And I know that for some of you guys, those people who are already starting to invest, it might be a bit of an easy topic for you. Um, but for the 61% of you guys who don't invest, these are some of the accounts that you can invest in. So the first one might be a tax-free savings account or a TFSA. And basically this isn't exactly like a savings account. It's more like an investing account where the gains that you get from your investments within a TFSA are not taxed. For some of you guys who might be a bit older or maybe when you graduate and become a staff, you might be looking into an RRSP or a registered retirement savings plan. It's a tax deferral account and it helps decrease your tax bracket. And it's often used for retirement savings because as doctors, we do not get pensions. For you guys who have children, um, you might be considering an RESP or a registered education savings plan. Um, and just the main thing to be careful of are management companies who will say they'll manage your um, RESP, but they have really high fees. For those of you who are maybe in the residence category, you might look into incorporating as a staff and it's another tax deferral vehicle, which means that you don't have to pay tax on or you don't pay as much tax on your um, investments within a corp until a bit later. And it's also can be used for retirement savings, maternity leave, and for some individuals, um, some certain types of businesses, liability protection. 
And lastly, just an unregistered account. So everything in that account, all of your earnings will get taxed at your tax um, personal tax rate. And so how do these accounts work? Because a lot of people, when they hear these, the, these like acronyms, there's like so many acronyms, like how does it work? So let's say you have a pot. This pot represents your account, your TFSA, RSP, RESP, Corp, or unregistered account. And you can buy these pots or you can, where these pots are offered can be at banks or online brokerages, robo-advisors, things like that. And so let's say your money is like dirt. You put the dirt into your account, but you don't do anything with the money. Like you don't tell your banker to invest it in anything. The dirt just sits there. So a lot of people like might tell me, they might get confused and they might say, oh, I'll just put my money in a TFSA and it'll grow. But it won't grow because when you just put dirt in a pot, it doesn't do anything. It only grows when you put your money into investments. So for example, investments are like the seeds that you put your money or that you put your money in. So for example, they might include those ETFs that you guys uh, voted for, stocks, bonds, or GICs, for instance, just to name a few. And so when you use your money and you diversify it through these different seeds, it grows into your portfolio. That's how your money grows, not just by letting it sit in an account. You have to invest it into something. And that's where, for example, your banker might help you with that. Or if you're more of a DIY person, um, you would be putting your money to good use. And so what kind of investments um, can you buy with that account? For instance, stocks, they're also known as equity or securities. And I just wanted to clarify a lot of these um, terms because sometimes they have different uh, terms and it can confuse people in the beginning. You can buy ETFs, which are exchange traded funds. You can buy REITs um, or real estate investment trusts. Um, you can buy um, like things like mutual funds, uh, index funds, or bonds, also known as fixed, fixed income or debt securities. And so in the next slide, I just wanted to tell you kind of like a very brief overview. When should I do what? Like I see all my classmates either investing in this or that. Should I be doing that right now at my, my, um, my year? So, for example, when you're in first and second year of med school, some of the things you want to focus on doing is, you know, making sure that you have a, a, an ability to budget, that you're not getting yourself overly in debt. You might want to start by creating your own budgeting spreadsheet and learning to keep track of your expenses so that when you do have to do like major tax returns with an accountant down the line, you're already in the habit of doing that. You can start learning about student taxes and some of you might have a side hustle. When you're in third and fourth year, that's when things can get expensive when it comes to CARMs and stuff like that. So some people might have to choose to have an emergency fund. Some people will choose to use their line of credit as an emergency fund, assuming they haven't like, you know, blown all of their line of credit already. It's important to budget because at least at U of T, when you keep track of your expenses for CARMs, there's these grant programs um, that will actually um, look at all of your expenses and they'll give you um, a grant based on all of your expenses to get like 40% off of uh, all you paid for CARMS. Um, you are you're gonna start looking at disability insurance and as you transition to residency, that's a good time to start building your financial team uh, who like things, people who might be like accountants or who might be your disability insurance broker, your banker, financial advisor, things like that. When you're a first year resident to third year resident, you wanna start focusing on paying down and trying to reduce some of that debt you've accumulated in med school you might want to consider starting to invest in your TFSA um, just because you have that income coming in and you, you're able to invest. And you also want to, if you haven't already, start building your financial team. And when you're a staff, um, that's when you want to make sure you try to repay down, pay down your debt, especially if you're thinking of buying a house or something like that. Um, making sure that you're not just contributing to your TFSA, but contributing to your RSP to help bring you down to a lower tax bracket. And you might want to consider incorporating as well. And so in order to, when I mentioned this before, when you increase your net worth, you spend less money, but you also make more money. And that's where investing um, comes in. It helps you make more money. So just to um, give you a taste about the next couple of lectures, coming up is Ben Felix's lecture on investing, as well as my lecture on specialties and how much you can make doing what specialty. And I think a lot of the times they don't really touch on that that much. 
Um, and it's really awkward to ask your staff physician how much you make. So I'm going to tell you a little bit about um, how much you can anticipate in, to make uh, with your salary when it comes to what specialty you're going into. So the last section I just wanted to touch on is something called social determinants of wealth. And um, I'm not sure if this is like an actual like term, I just made it up. Um, but just like social determinants of health, social determinants of wealth is basically factors or social factors that might impact your ability to grow your net worth. So the first one I just wanted to talk about was financial abuse. And it's really important to know what's happening to your money. And if you do have a partner, just to not hand it over to them without knowing what they're doing with it. And financial abuse is something that can happen to high earners as well. And it happens to disproportionately higher amounts in women. And what, uh, women with disabilities or transgender individuals um, are at higher risk. And so what does financial abuse look like? Because it can happen to you and it has happened to some of my patients is sometimes you might hear your partner say things like, oh, just let me handle the finances since I know more about it than you. You're so busy as a doctor, let me just handle the bills. And they might say these things as considerate gestures at first, but you know, it can escalate until the abuser controls all of the accounts. And then you no longer know what's going on with your bank accounts um, because you don't have access to any of, you, any of your bank accounts. Or if you're a higher earner being made to feel guilty for that, people might, your partner might say to you, oh, you need to pay for this because you make more, you need to do this. And so it's all about trying to find a balance with, between you and your partner in your relationship. It's important to talk about money when you're entering a relationship with someone, especially if it's a serious relationship, because you don't want to end up being taken advantage of. The second thing I want to touch on is intergenerational debt. And this, have, this is a pretty uh, important topic to me, especially as an immigrant myself. And so as an immigrant, you know, we're really thankful to our parents um, for helping us get to where we are, getting us into medical school, um, you know, helping us develop into the individuals we are today. And so when our parents ask us for money, like for instance, in my, in my household, my parents don't have a retirement fund. They don't have an emergency fund. And so I feel obligated to help them because they're my parents. But the downside of that is that it's an invisible debt. It's not like a visible debt like tuition or the debts from our line of credit. It's invisible because we give our parents money, we help them so that they can retire, but it makes it harder for us to build our own wealth compared to other classmates who, for instance, may not have to support their own parents. And a subsection of intergenerational debt is something known as black debt. And on my social media, it was like incredibly a highly debated issue um, in the comments and so on. And the reason I want to touch on it is because throughout history, money has been used as a tool to oppress entire groups of people, such, such as through slavery, such as through unfavorable lending rates and discrimination in the financial service industry. And that is still felt by a lot of generations today. And so when you read the comments on things like my social media posts, educating people about black debt, you might see things like, oh, that's not a thing. Like, Banks don't discriminate against people based on their skin color today. Um, like, like, why are we even talking about this? But it's important to talk about because the ripple effects of something that happened back in history can still be felt amongst uh, racialized people today. And it still affects their ability to build wealth. And so the third um, social factor often occurs, happens to women in medicine and it's the gender pay gap. And you guys might ask, oh, well, if everyone is getting fee for service, um, getting paid by fee for service, how is it possible that women are earning less? And so just to kind of summarize some of the points from a lot of the articles that have been published in the CMAJ about the gender pay gap, um, women tend to be receiving referrals to lower paid procedures. A procedure that's a gynecological procedure may pay less than say a urological procedure. Um, sometimes if there's a patient that might be more uh, time intensive that you have to spend more time with them, they're sent to certain specialists for their better bedside manner. And a lot of the times these articles will say that these specialists tend to be women. Women tend to be concentrated in specialties that pay less. And finally, when it comes to social attitudes towards women's domestic roles, they, if they still exist as women, there's still some sort of imbalance when it comes to having to do more of the household chores and doing more of the unpaid work. And so I'm just gonna end with this section here by asking, answering this question, 
why should doctors care about money? So as doctors, we are huge advocates um, and advocacy is one of the tenets of medicine. So when we talk about advocating for any sort of change, you know, we need the people, people to protest, people to vote, to go on social media and uplift certain social justice causes. But the other biggest lever we need when it comes to driving change is actually money, money to back up these people. Money because money talks and businesses will listen, politicians will listen. And so when we put our money towards, you know, impact investing, towards philanthropic causes and social justice causes, or when it comes to backing certain political agendas as opposed to other, other political agendas, money is a very powerful lever for change. So as doctors, as a collective group, we actually have substantive financial and fundraising power. So when we say things like, oh, I'm not the expert when it comes to my finances, or, you know, I'm just going to hand over my, my finances to someone else, we're essentially giving up a very powerful tool to drive change and to advocate. And so I just wanted to thank you all for coming today and to using up your weekend to learn about, um, to educate yourself about finances, because education earns you, makes you a living, but self-education makes you a fortune. So that concludes the end of my slides. If you have any other questions, um, feel free to ask the moderators and they will let me know what uh, the questions are.